In the course of history, we've seen many major, impactful, world-changing conflicts with long-reaching consequences on the geopolitical stage. This is not one of those conflicts, but it would be one of the most well-known conflicts in Australian history. Hi, my name is Gabe Bauer, and this is Top Shelf History, where we combine great stories with great drinks. This is Feathered Fury. It is the cocktail I have made for you today based on the immortal conflict between the Australians and the Emu, which really did happen in the Great Emu War of 1932. The drink is made with three ingredients, Pim's number one, wild turkey bourbon, and grenadine. It's a drink fit for a bird, but also just as tasty for man. So, how does one go to war with birds? Well, it all has to do with farming. You see, after World War I, the veterans from Australia came back home and realized that they kind of wanted something new to do, something to rebuild their lives. And the government looked at them and said, we'll be happy to subsidize you. We'll give you farmland out in Western Australia and you guys can you know, build these wheat farms, help bolster our surplus, while at the same time rebuild your lives from one of the worst wars that the entire world and Australia had ever seen so far. But in 1929, the entire world's dopamine levels took a massive dip as they saw their bank accounts be collectively empty due to the Great Depression. And as a result, it hit Australia particularly hard for a couple reasons. One, Australia was big on exporting, especially food, and now they had a massive surplus because nobody was buying anything. Two, they had just linked their currency to the gold standard, but also to the British pound, and due to the British monetary policy, the Australian dollar was now suffering as well. So with farmers having a crap ton of extra surplus food that they couldn't sell, they were suffering economically, and they looked at the government and said, hey, help? And the government said, sure, of course we'll help you. We'll even subsidize you. We'll buy your stuff, don't worry. And then they didn't. They totally let it slip through the cracks. And the Western Australian men and women were like, um, what is happening? Why are you lying to us? And they were getting pretty angry because, you know, they're getting desperate with all of the food that's going away and the money that they don't have. And they were thinking of even seceding, which the United Kingdom, Australia is still part of the Commonwealth with, said, uh, yeah, you can't secede. We're not going to let you secede. So now the Western Australians who are living in perhaps the most brutal area to farm in the entirety of Australia at the time are left with not a lot of great options. They can't really go to the federal government. They won't help them. So instead, they look to their local state senator or their province senator, Mr. George Pierce. Now, Sir George Pierce, I should say, was also the Minister of Defense, and he was willing to help, especially when really big six-foot birds came crashing through their town and destroying all of their crops, because not only were they suffering economically, but now any crops that they did have and their farms were now being eaten alive by the birds and also trampled and defecated on. Their fences were being destroyed and the vermin were picking up the scraps. So. Pierce looked at the situation and said, yeah, of course, I'm going to help you. And I know that your little rifles aren't going to really take care of these massive birds. After all, the emu, the bird which was doing all the damage, was the national bird, but it had become a national pest. So the people wanted solutions, but how particularly did we want to solve it? Did we want new fences? No, no, no. We wanted new weaponry, guns, machine guns specifically, Lewis guns to be even more specific. Lewis guns were used extensively throughout World War I and were very, very effective. And Pierce thought that they would be equally effective against the birds themselves. So he okayed the mission to hand some Lewis guns to a couple of his military men and go and get rid of the problem. He even said, hell, let's make a movie out of it. And he hired a film crew to go film the entire thing. Seriously, the Great Emu War was on film. 
I can't wait to see the History Channel sit there and say, tonight on our special feature, the Great Emu War in color. I would pay top money to go see that. So, armed and ready, George Pierce dispatched three particular men to deal with the Emu threat. Major Meredith, Sergeant McMurray, and Gunner O'Halloran. Armed with two Lewis guns, the men descended upon the town of Campion on November 2nd, 1932. See, the emu had launched an attack like a blitzkrieg upon the unsuspecting town and had now occupied it for themselves, the feathered tyrants with their tight grip on the innocent, sleepy town of Campion, Western Australia. They arrived on that morning. It had been wet, as it had been raining only a few days before, and they saw a detachment of 50 or so birds in the distance. The men moved forward, guns at the ready. They took aim and fired into the crowd of birds, their first volley of the war. It only killed a few because the distance was so far away that soon after firing, they were able to scatter and cunningly make their frantic retreat. The day had been won, although a few birds had perished. Perhaps a dozen or so, but in their sleek getaway, they were able to win the first day. Two days later, Meredith heard of scouting reports from his men and farmers, and by their own observation, realized that the emu had secured a strategic position at a local dam. They inched forward, and they surrounded the area, and they noticed that a thousand emu were coming down upon their position. Meredith and his men were crouching in the low grass, waiting for them to get close, and just as they did, they leaped up and started opening fire. It would have been a massacre and a major victory for the Australians had their guns not almost immediately jammed and allowed the birds to get away. It was, once again, a sheer and cunning retreat for the emu, but 12 birds gave their lives to the emu cause that day. By the fourth day of the conflict, Meredith and his men had noticed a change in the enemy tactics. Instead of coming together as one large group, they instead sectioned themselves off into smaller squadron-like mobs, this time waging their own campaign of guerrilla warfare. Each mob had its own leader, distinguished by his black plumage. He would stand as guard and observer, making sure to keep guard for the rest of his feathered tyrants as they waged their terrorist campaign upon the wheat fields. Now, this particular tactic proved to be exceptionally effective as it made machine guns practically uneconomical. As one squadron fell, the remainder were able to get away, most likely to counterattack later. And with 20,000 emu and a single mob, that's a group of emus by the way, it would seem that the enemy would be insurmountable. So Meredith and his men realized that they had to have a change of their own maneuvers. Realizing that he had to pursue the fleet-footed fowl at pace, Meredith and his men mounted the machine gun on top of a truck and followed suit. Had the ride not been too rough, the truck too slow, and the bullets too inaccurate, it would have been a rousing success. And at this embarrassment, Meredith and his men had decided to wave the white flag and finally surrender to the emu. But you see, as Meredith and his men decided to abandon the town of Campion and withdraw their forces, the farmers who were leading the resistance decided it was not time to give up. They petitioned once again to the government for help, and once again, Meredith and his men would answer the call. This time, it would be a campaign of revenge. Now, mind you, this one would be a little bit more successful, which isn't saying much considering their initial tries but they would kill about 100 emu per week. And by December 10th, they had killed 986 of them while also firing off 10,000 shots. So formidable were the emu that Major Meredith went on to say that if the Australian military had the bullet carrying capacity of the emu, it would be able to face up against any army in the world. They faced down machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. Man, can you believe that that's real? This is why I love history. That actually happened. I mean, what country declares war on birds and loses? That is fantastic. And it is because of that that we have to make a drink after it. So let's get into our drink, the Feathered Fury. Now we're going to start off our drink with putting out our little shaker glass there because I think it's only appropriate that for a drink about a war with birds that we use a bourbon 
that symbolizes probably what the Australians felt these guys were, wild turkeys. Un, untamed, destructive, maybe delicious. I don't know, I've never tried emu. But I know that this bourbon is quite delicious. So we're gonna start out our drink with one ounce of wild turkey bourbon. And while, you know, this is the first time that I've actually ever tried uh, wild turkey and uh, it was a, uh, fairly sweet. I was surprised to find it be um, a little bit sweeter than most other bourbons. Uh, not a, nearly as sharp, but it's actually really quite tasty and I think uh, gives a good amount of body to our drink here too. So a good foundation uh, as far as mixology goes. We're gonna add a little bit of ice here to our glass because we wanna awaken the flavors, uh, any of the nuanced flavors that are coming from our bourbon. So we're just gonna give that a quick stir. There we go, and that dilutes also at the same time some of the bourbon. Next, we're gonna put out our rocks glass and we're going to end up straining our bourbon into our glass because the next two are not going to be mixed, at least in the shaker. And we don't wanna dilute them either because our next ingredient is going to be Pim's number one. Now, when I was trying to figure out this drink, I'm like, how the heck am I gonna make a drink about a war with birds? Wild turkey was fairly convenient, but I wanted to connect it in some way to the Australians. Now, finding liquor from Australia is very difficult. Originally, I thought maybe I'll combine it with Foster's, which is my least favorite beer, and if you've tried it, you'd probably agree with me. And my first experiments with Foster's and adding it with wild turkey, it's the grossest thing ever. It's as much of a tragedy as Australians going to war with birds. Never do it, unless you wanna make your friends gag. Just saying. So instead, I figured let's go with Pimm's. Pimm's number one is uh, a more herbally uh, liquor. Very delicious, it comes from Great Britain and since Australia is still part of the Commonwealth with the United Kingdom, I feel like it's a good fit there and kind of alludes somewhat to our Australian brothers. So we're gonna put in one ounce of Pimm's into our glass. Finally, to symbolize the blood that was spilt for the emu cause and for the wheat that had been fallen as a result, so we wanna you know, represent both sides here, we're going to put in a little bit of dark red sweetness, some homemade grenadine. And at only a half ounce, it'll add a lot of flavor, a good amount of balance, and really round out our drink well. So let's just pour that on out and pour that on in. Now you see that beautiful dark color, kind of rem reminiscent of, I'm sure, the, the dried blood on the sand of the emu and the Australians that <laughs> went at it for like a month and a half. It's just amazing. We're gonna give that a really quick stir. And then finally, we are going to garnish with perhaps the most appropriate of garnishes for our drink. A cherry that has been speared with the feather of the emu. Now this isn't actually an emu feather, those are kind of hard to get, but a feather to remember our emu brother is by. And with that we have our feathered fury. And I have to say, it really does look quite good. Um, I love the feather, it actually reminds me of some of the Australian hats that you may see when they pin them up to the side and you have the feathers. And that was actually one of the things that George Pierce was asked to do after they killed some of the emu. They were asked to take some of the feathers and then use them to make little uh, uh, accessories for their hats. Unfortunately, it didn't go that well, but uh, let's give our drink a try. Mm. Mm. Oh, that is really, really good, actually. The, uh, the wild turkey has a nice smoky sweetness. Definitely more leaning on the sweet, but I love the, the floral herbal uh, punch that you get from the pims coming up behind it. Really balances each other out well, and then you get uh, a nice little subtle fruitiness from the grenadine as well. And all while having your nose tickled by that, uh, that delightful little feather. I think it really is a drink that is really quite tasty uh, and um, probably would be received better by Australians than perhaps re re reminding them of uh, the war that they fought back in the 30s. But definitely a drink worth trying yourself. And that sounds like last call. 
So emus, man, they were a big problem for the Australians back in the 30s, so much so that even after declaring a war upon them, they weren't able to actually win that war. Uh, but the reckoning did come a little bit afterwards. Now, mind you, in between the farce that was that war, and it was, it's hilarious, it's become an internet meme for a reason. I mean, these people actually suggested bombing the emus from a plane dropping bombs and exploding. And the government kind of laughed at that point, and I would too. Uh, reporters were sitting there and they were saying, hey, you know, the emu have fantastic uh, resolve in all of this. And uh, it was really, they were really letting the Western Australians have it, but they would end up getting their revenge a little bit later because uh, they enacted a bounty campaign. And the campaign had actually been in place prior to the emu war, but it extended past it as well, uh, in which the government would pay a certain amount of money per head of emu to help deal with the, the pest problem. And in one year, 50,000 were claimed, and that was just crazy. So much so that environmentalists and bird lovers would actually raise the alarm over the treatment of the emu, saying that what they were trying to do was essentially put them into extinction, which is pretty drastic considering that the bird was the national bird of Australia. And another particular development of technology that helped out with the farmers was the development of better fences. They actually found out that electrified fences ended up being a lot more effective against the emus and wasn't nearly as lethal against the birds and uh, actually is something that they use a lot today. Certainly a lot more effective than just handing Lewis guns to a couple of guys and saying have at it and shoot as many birds as you can. Thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to check out any of our other historically inspired cocktails, you can find them here. You could also find them at TopShelfHistory.com. We are also on Rumble and Locals. Please check out our Locals community. That is where you guys get to interact a lot with me. Also, if you guys want to support the show, you can become a, one of our patrons over there as well. We have our premium content specifically for those who support the show with our after hours and our behind the bar. So please consider checking it out out and possibly even supporting the show. Every single dollar means so much to us. You guys are the reason that we do all of this uh, and we enjoy bringing you guys more and more content. But from all of us here at Top Shelf History, remember history is better with a drink. Cheers.